to today's more resonance. Only this is a weird kind of resonance, uh, very, very powerful. And I want to make a connection between it and our old friend, the trebuchet. That is, uh, uh, this is our last uh, chance to look at uh, a little more, more insight about how that uh, amazing machine works. But this, this is also a connection to quantum mechanics, electronic band theory, and analogous uh, classical and quantum mechanics will be the first half of this lecture. Now, this th business about band theory re really is uh, not talked about very much, uh, certainly not the analogy, and really should be at the end of this where we'll return to the uh, C2 symmetry, C3 symmetry, so on, uh, uh, ideas of generalizing the U2 uh, description that we just finished in the lecture 23. The uh, thing that I want to show you is waves, a little bit of uh, classical and quantum waves. So there are a few things in this that you will understand better after we've done this, but I thought it would be a good idea to do this one first because it's good to be awake while you're lo looking at this. This is a fairly tricky bunch of business. It's an approximate analogy, so that makes it even more tricky. But let's get started and do that, and then we'll see how things are going. As I had warned you when we started this uh, Unit 4, uh, the um, linear or additive resonances of Lorentz's uh, disco discoveries in the um, uh, mathematics that we use in almost all of electrical engineering is one kind of resonance. Uh, the other kind that uh, we're going to talk about today is what I would say is nonlinear as opposed to linear or multiplicative resonance. Now remember what happened with the linear resonance and that was we had a Newton's law equation. Your acceleration is equal to force uh, proportional uh, to whatever the inertia is with a minus omega x on this side and then maybe something we would be uh, wiggling uh, to uh, cause a resonance. So this is a case where the source of the, um, shall we say, um, <clears throat> effect uh, on the oscillator is put on the left hand, I'm sorry, right hand side of the equation and uh, causes uh, resonance that uh, makes an Archimedean spiral, that is a spiral in which the R increases linearly uh, with the angle. So that was our phase picture of a resonance. This one puts that uh, wiggling force right up against the dependent variable, the amplitude of the oscillator, uh, a constant plus an oscillating thing. And uh, that is the equation of motion as opposed to this. So this is multiplicative. The uh, force is being multiplying uh, uh, in the differential equation of the dependent variable. Now, these are both uh, differential equations in time. The dot, uh, as opposed to a prime, means a uh, time derivative, as you know, uh, in this course. Um, so here we have a time independent variable equation that resembles, have you seen this before? This is Schrodinger's equation. If x was a psi wave function and this was a potential, it's just at the independent variable's time now. So that is uh, something that's uh, quite uh, powerful. And uh, we're going to use a, a pendulum accelerated up and down. That, to me, is the most simple uh, mechanical analog of uh, this type of, of uh, parametric resonance. Parametric means that we're wiggling uh, the uh, term that uh, multiplies the variable, the parameter, uh, Hooke's parameter, if you, if you will. This is a kx, right? 
we're going to wiggle that K, you see. Or if it's a cyclotron uh, 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 oscillator, we're going to wiggle the frequency of the cyclotron, you see. And uh, the result is uh, very easy to make an exponential blow up. And as opposed to the gentle Archimedean spirals, we can make up a, a big boom, mm -hmm. big bang, the name of our textbook. Okay? So this is really classical mechanics with a bang, where it's happening with resonance. So uh, let's see how we it as we do that. Here are the two protagonists, the good old fashioned um, oscillator, the quasi linear. Uh, resonance could be a pendulum if we didn't take the uh, angle too large. Uh, we're going to be mostly required to do both of these, uh, both of these analogs uh, that phi not get too big. Uh, as long as phi stays small, we're going to have a bunch of solutions that aren't explosive. And those are the ones, of course, that in quantum mechanics you're interested in because that's where the actual eigenfunctions. Uh, can uh, uh, be bounded. Uh, the same thing is, is true if I were to uh, talk about this oscillation. So the two kinds of oscillation, one in which uh, you move the thing back and forth, and if you have a pendulum it's really easy to do that. You see, I can very quickly make that thing ring. It's, it's no problem figuring out how to move my hand to make it swing, right? Very natural thing to do. Uh, this one is a little tougher. First of all, if I do it up and down, it's not going to go anywhere if the thing is hanging straight down, but it was, and it's a little off. So every once in a while, if I'm going up and down, it, it just takes off. That's the uh, explosive part of the nonlinear resonance. The parametric amplification is uh, very powerful for uh, laser mechanics and things like that. So. Uh, what you have here, first of all, is an F equal MA equation of Newton or the Lorentz equation with gamma equal to zero. Remember, that's the friction. We have no friction in, in our discussion today. We have enough problems with what we've got. So uh, this compared to this, and notice, time replaces the, uh, the uh, independent variable uh, that was x uh, uh, in, in uh, <clears throat> the Schrodinger equation. Okay, now, uh, a general case, a more uh, that something would go beyond what we're going to talk about today, but something that's going to happen when we actually do simulations of this is that uh, the uh, variable that's, that sits here uh, in a system like this is a sign fee, not a fee. And the variable that sits uh, uh, should be sitting right there, but is uh, replaced by one for small phi, the cosine, uh, would be there. So if you had both of these motions going on, like you do in a trebuchet, uh, that's the nasty equation that you really uh, would want to solve if you uh, study. And uh, it's very close to what we'll be solving. Uh, uh, we won't put anything of that in there, but we will have effects that are uh, really involving uh, a sign when the thing blows up. Okay, now let, let's uh, just, since we're in Arkansas, let's see where it is uh, that you might have encountered this kind of, of explosive resonance. And that is a little stick with a propeller on the end, and the propeller is held with a very uh, thin pin or nail and the idea is that you rub that stick and make the ends of it vibrate. And when the ends of that vibrate, they become parametric amplifi amplifier of the rotation of a propeller. But it's a trick on, on how you have to hold the thing with your finger so that it, it pushes it in one particular, keeps the uh, oscillation in just an up and down uh, direction. And uh, you can... Uh, I wish I had one so I could show you how it's hard to r run this thing, but then you learn that trick of pushing with your finger, and it works really marvelously. Anyway, that's a very simple sort of uh, backwoods uh, example of parametric amplification. We'd like to do a little better 
So we hope to be building a device like this, as I say, someday, I've been saying someday for quite a few years now, uh, I think we'll get around to it this uh, coming year. It's something that we'd really like to have along with all the other equipment that's in here. So um, this is, of course, the early applications of, of parametric amplification, uh, more recent and then for the future in the mechanics department. Okay, so let's take these two equations, uh, Schrodinger equation with a potential, and let's take a potential of a crystal, the simplest possible, a model for a potential of a repetitive uh, system, uh, just a single cosine. Uh, obviously, you'd like to have other uh, terms in a Fourier series uh, there. Uh, today, we'll just have one. And we're going to make the analogy between this and this uh, equation here that describes the effect felt by uh, a pendulum that's, that's riding in an oscillating Einstein elevator, right? Mm -hmm. As you go up, the gravity becomes very high and uh, very negative, very down, right? And then as you reach the top, as you do in the, uh, that airplane called the Vomit Comet that Na NASA flies, uh, it goes uh, down and then rises up over a parabolic thing. Everybody inside, uh, if the pilot is uh, careful, has zero gravity for a few seconds. Usually it's shorter than a minute because eventually you've got to, <laughs> you know, uh, come back to uh, not Earth. <laughs> stay in the sky. So we're adding here, you see, an acceleration due to uh, whatever it is that's pushing up and down on the fulcrum of the pendulum. So our acceleration, our extra acceleration here uh, in the parameter of the pendulum oscillator is uh, very uh, much like uh, the extra amount of uh, potential uh, that's contributing to something that otherwise would just be a simple Bohr orbital with a constant. Okay? So, main difference. Independent variable. It's space here, it's time there. But equations are the same. Okay? It's just a matter of how we play them. Alright? This is called the Mathieu equation. French Matthew, we sometimes say in, in this country. Uh, when you have just a cosine and a constant. So, so is that. That's a Matthew equation in time. Now, uh, we have nx here. What we're going to do is we're going to place this uh, nx. This is what determines uh, how many wiggles you have uh, per meter. Uh, this is what determines how many wiggles you have per time. We call it a frequency. So. The pendulum of joking up and down is going to have a frequency, either slow or fast, okay? That's something we'll be able to contr you know, control, set in our animations and so forth. And uh, you, you will have a, it squared outside here. That makes it a little bit more complicated, uh, perhaps, than this one, which just has a constant sitting but um, what we're going to do is we're going to make connection relations between these two equations. That this is where the physics comes in. And the nx over here will be uh, omega y equal uh, times time over there, you see, as we map between these two uh, equations. And another uh, thing that we will have uh, is a differential relation that involves dx and dt. They'll be the ratio of a integer in this case and the frequency that we can adjust uh, continuously over there. So um, those are the first of our connection relations. Now, uh, you'll see later on why it's important to stick yourself with uh, two-fold symmetry, that is to allow only two full oscillations and when you do that you get what uh, band theory people call the band or Brillouin zone boundary modes. Uh, that's something that's a little bit technical that will make more sense uh, later on. But um, 
if we restrict our integer to two, uh, we get the envelope of a band, and uh, all of the uh, states lie between envelopes. If we know where the envelopes are, we pretty well uh, solve both of these problems. So that's a simplification of these equations, both of them. Uh, over here we have energy, and that's going to be equal to this rather complicated uh, collection of the parameters for the time equation. The uh, basic acceleration of gravity that we had already before we added the acceleration up or down, this being uh, uh, acceleration down over there, and then uh, n squared, that is the connection uh, n squared over omega y squared times g over l is going to be equal to what we call energy eigenvalues, actually, of the Schrodinger equation. Okay? So you see already it's a fairly complicated connection between an analogy that's, at first sight, fairly simple. And while we're at it, we'll notice that the omega y squared cancels rather nicely over there. And uh, we're left with uh, n squared times that acceleration coefficient, or actually the a y uh, of this, which is the constant times the cosine uh, uh, there. Um, and <clears throat> now I'm, I'm taking the Schrodinger equation over here, just putting it under there and making the connections here uh, of the potential height with the acceleration amplitude, these are constants, and we're going to set that one equal to 1, so it'll be out of here, and we're going to have n equal to 2, so that, that simplifies this thing uh, considerably. For n equal to an L, a potentialum of unit length, I have potential directly related to four times whatever my acceleration uh, um, constant amplitude uh, is, a for amplitude of the y acceleration of that pendulum. And then the E, that's a little weird, because now the E, you see, which in quantum mechanics would be h bar omega frequency of quantum frequency, uh, here is inverse square of the frequency that you're going to wiggle this pendulum with. So that's a pretty complicated little difference, and it makes a big difference in the physics. Okay, so electronic band theory, if you could imagine an electron being subject to a perfect cosine, more like a free electron laser where they make a cosine a potential for the uh, electrons to surf on. Uh, that's uh, more than what we're going to be doing here. But anyway, we're going to start with the simplest Schrodinger potential, no potential, if V is zero, I just have this thing, and h bar is equal to 1, and the mass of the electron is equal to 1. So we're using very natural units here. Um, and then this thing right here, which is just the pendulum sitting there and swinging uh, all by itself in the gravity uh, that we uh, uh, have been uh, given here. So uh, that uh, frequency uh, of a pendulum is the constant g divided by l, l we're going to say equal to 1. Over here, uh, the energy uh, thing that uh, is connected to that uh, has just simply the square of the wave vector of a Bohr orbital. Okay, so the eigen solutions for this are pretty f familiar. Well, so are they for the pendulum. They're just the familiar phasor waves with uh, this constant uh, omega zero multiplying time. Here, uh, the wave vector momentum, if you will, uh, uh, k uh, is multiplying the uh, spatial variable. And remember, that is the connection between these two. And uh, periodic boundary conditions are really nice. We can just imagine that uh, we really have this wave in a box from 0 to L, so that this k has to be uh, um, uh, uh, quantized, that is, it has to be a multiple of an integer, and the coefficient has to be that box length uh, divided into 2 pi. Similar thing happening over here, 
It's just that now we're going to say we're going to restrict all of the solutions that we consider, all time solutions, to those that repeat perfectly. Remember, that's kind of a game we've been playing, looking for perfect repetitions in classical problems. We're going to ask that we only consider times uh, that uh, satisfy uh, a match with the frequency of the uh, pendulum. Okay, so again, connections that uh, you might not have thought of for that one, this one fairly obvious. And then we're going to uh, limit uh, both uh, analogies to that, uh, that constraint, so to speak. There will be allowed energies and frequencies. In this case, the k squared of 1 squared, 2 squared, 3 squared, 4 squared is going to be uh, a, a, a rule here. And over here, the omega is going to be, in this time, plus or minus 1, plus or minus 2, plus or minus 3, and so forth. It's really plus or minus k there, so that really, that's pretty much the same. Now, with a non-zero V, okay, and in particular a V that has only one Fourier component, namely the cosine actually has two, plus and minus the uh, uh, e to the i of the argument, uh, we have, a, 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 in general, for any V, an equation of that nature, which we're going to write in the quantum Dirac notation. So this is a case where we're going to solve a classical problem uh, using quantum mechanics. Okay, a little bit different than what you're used to. Um, but in any case, this is a matrix eigenvalue equation that we're uh, going to be solving here. So I'm going to write a little bit of it out, and then we'll uh, take it apart. Uh, so this is just this equation uh, written out, and, and here I have um, a uh, matrix element between e to the i jx, and it's the complex conjugate of it because it's a bra, so I have minus i j x, j is, if you remember, an integer. And then I have e to the i k x, k is another thing that has to be uh, integers, okay? Uh, in this case, squares of, in, of integers. And uh, that becomes an integral of this right here. There's the uh, cosine right there written out. It's two Fourier components. So we're asking for an integral of basically exponentials between 0 and 2 pi. And you should know the answer to that. If you don't, you better go your bone up on it, because that's definitely going to be on a qualifying exam. Um, the delta k plus n and k minus n for a, a cosine that has a Fourier uh, term, the nth Fourier term. And as remember, if you remember what we were going to restrict this to, we're going to restrict it to n equal 2. You could make it even n equal 1, then we'd only get one term here, but n equal 2 gets you both sides of the story we're trying to tell you. Okay, so I want to move these guys up to the top and look at the form of the matrix eigenvalue equation that this gives. And uh, so there, there's the calculation I was talking about of the matrix elements, and we realize that it's only zero for those j's that are k plus n or k minus n, so that's very restrictive. I might as well just show you the results so you should see what it is. With n equal to 2, uh, we can have either even or odd uh, things separate. We can do them separately. So uh, we're going to have a matrix here that has plus and minus 2 with 2 squared as a, a, a thing, and then connects with just 2 more or 2 less. And that's going to be true for every one of these uh, diagonal elements, you see. So that they'll be mostly perturbed by their neighbors here, you see. And that's something we'll talk about later on when we do the, the um, classical analysis of oscillating chains uh, later in this lecture, but uh, the, right now we're imagining that this goes forever. So uh, you would say, well, in order to solve this problem, I'm going to need an infinite amount of time and an infinite amount of memory. But as you probably already know, 
is that if the nu here, this, this little coefficient, uh, this coefficient right here, which uh, is the uh, amplitude of the Schrodinger potential, this thing over 2, or it's the twice the amplitude of the acceleration uh, uh, for the problem that's on this side of the, of the board. I should be pointing it because it's not there anymore. But uh, it, the, this, this acceleration constant uh, is, this thing, is what's going to be sitting in our classical analog. But right now, for the quantum analog, it's just the uh, amplitude of the uh, ups and downs of the potential uh, over 2. That means the potential goes up and down, then it's halfway uh, there to, uh, on that coefficient. And for n equal 2 and l equal 1, it gets very simple. So it's just a matter of uh, getting out any um, modern mathematical methods like Mathematica or MathCAD, or even just programming yourself a, a diagonalization routine that diagonalizes a matrix that, say, stops right there. Or if you want more precision, maybe the next uh, one. And you've got to do that one for the odds. And you're done. You have the numbers that are needed uh, to analyze both of these problems, the classical and the quantum um, Matthew equation. Very different from what you find in textbooks to describe solutions of Matthew equations, which are excruciating solutions uh, that um, only work a little bit, and then they have to be uh, extended in, uh, in almost exponential complexity. Our computers really help us. We can just go ahead and diagonalize uh, a matrix of not too big. If you look in the textbook, I find uh, that I can do a 3 by 3 and 4 by 4 and take care of all of the interesting cases that we're uh, describing uh, uh, here. In any case, um, the idea is to find out how these eigenvalues, energy in the case of Schrodinger, or uh, what we're uh, more interested in is the connection between uh, these, that is inverse frequency of values of the uh, thing that's jerking the pendulum up and down, okay? And this is the most complicated relationship. We're going to have this equal to uh, a, a 4 and this equal to 1, so it, it gets a lot simpler. And uh, we'll be looking at um, we're going to set g equal to 1 while we're at it, so we'll really be looking at a relationship that has the frequency of the up and down acceleration of the pendulum equal to inverse square root of the eigenvalues that are coming out uh, here. So I'm going ahead and working out a few of the eigenvalues for the matrices that are on the preceding uh, ones. These are the two odd uh, eigenvalues, 1 plus and minus 1 and then plus and minus 2 uh, right here. And they have eigenvalues uh, that are uh, listed right there. And the uh, idea is that I need to take uh, 2 over the square root of those eigenvalues. And that's, so those are the numbers that we're going to plug into our simulator uh, specifying the uh, eigenfrequency that will give you the band edge uh, waves uh, for that particular uh, thing. Now, uh, wherever, and this is something uh, that's not explained terribly well here, but if you look at the eigenvalues that we're getting here that go into uh, this part of the calculation where we make the connection, you'll see that they start, uh, some of them down in the, in the well of the cosine wave. This one has a negative value, whereas all of the others are higher up above the potential so high that finally they're approaching the square of the quantum or quantum number here, right? This is almost four. This is almost nine. The next one would be to five figures, uh, the uh, sixteen. Hmm. Okay, and the same thing's happening over here. You see, so it's just these lower guys that are going to be funny numbers. The ones that are up higher are just going to be squares of uh, odd or even integer. Okay. Anyway, we, to make our connection with a classical uh, parametric amplifier, have to uh, do 2 over the square root of those. But what you have to worry about, of course, is when your eigenvalues are negative. 
doesn't bother the quantum mechanics. Nobody worries when an eigenvalue of E energy goes negative, right? It's just below zero. You can put your zero anywhere you want and it won't affect any of the dynamics, right? But um, uh, what in the world are we going to do when we have to take the square root of that? And the answer is, and this is, as I say, something you need to read a few lines in the text to make sense of, is that I put uh, the fact that my pendulum will be inverted in the description uh, that involves a negative eigenvalue uh, up here. And there are two cases here, so there'll be two cases where the pendulum will actually be sitting upside down and stable. Wow, that's pretty neat, okay? That's a case of, of parametric non-amplification, parametric creation of stability. Okay, and that's what you, of course, need in a band of electron waves. You don't want the electron wave blowing up. Okay? It's part of the quantization thing. So this is a picture of those band edges that come from uh, working out all of those uh, eigenvalues. And this is the actual quantum mechanical energy or I haven't done this uh, inverse square root yet uh, that we need uh, to get our uh, frequencies. But I don't have to. Um, I think for the machine that we're going to be building, we definitely have to do that and have to make it something that we would, a uh, whole new uh, uh, simulation program that really takes advantage of this and draws the curves for the omega. But I think what you should notice right away is if I pick a particular value for the height of the undulations of the potential, which means I'm picking a particular uh, height for the undulations of the amplitude of the uh, pendulum that I'm jerking up and down, uh, I can pick any value on here and I just happen to pick uh, out of the uh, uh, 1 to uh, 14, I pick something very close to 2, okay? The, that's the uh, V0 equal 2 and gives me an energy uh, eigenvalue here of E equal minus 0.44. I think you might have remembered that one. And then there's one that's really small, very slightly negative. Those two are the bounds of a stable region where the pendulum will literally sit upside down against gravity. And that we need to see, to believe. <laughs> uh, so, but up here, uh, it's business as usual. All the pendulums up here are stable upside down. In other words, they're not behaving like trebuchets and whing, uh, throwing something. Okay, But in here, and in here, that's where the trebuchets live, okay? So that, that just to set the stage for the uh, simulations that are, are, are coming here, which I hope will work. And they're all brand new today on the web. Before this, they were done by the old-fashioned old uh, Max 9.0. All right, let's see if there's anything else I need to say here. Uh, here are the values that work. Uh, looking at, that's the uh, case for n equal to 2 and l equal to 1. And while we're at it, I'm going to move this guy ahead. Uh, just a good thing to look at again what we're doing here, uh, comparing these two uh, time-like and space-like uh, uh, oscillators. And there's the crazy things that could actually make that happen. Uh, Schrodinger wave equation with its connection relations, okay? And fortunate cancellations that give us a simple formula for the connection. But the energy frequency one is the weird one, the inverse square uh, relation there, okay? So uh, we're now setting up the matrix, and presumably we've solved that matrix for a few cases up to about uh, nine. Okay. This thing doesn't go uh, uh, <clears throat> much higher uh, than that, but there's lots of stuff up there happening. doesn't mean it's not interesting, but it is more. So uh, what we're going to do is we're going to actually run the simulations on the better computer, 
so that you can see uh, what it is uh, we're talking about. Now, uh, I think what I'll do is um, I might as well run the inverted cases first. Now, in the inverted cases, uh, and you see, what I'm asking you to do is use a little bit of what you know from your quantum mechanics, or if you've studied a little bit of solid state physics, you know uh, that if I have a potential that's oscillating, I have uh, waves that uh, uh, go uh, sort of uh, straight, that is, uh, they, they start to take off exponentially when you're in the non-classical region. Now, when the uh, pendulum is inverted in the classical analog, we're talking about um, the plot of the uh, energy be turned over negative. So, uh, let's see if that's right. Um, no, we're talking about ones in which it is uh, exactly the way it should be. That is, this, this is the top of a potential well uh, right here, and this is a bottom. Uh, this is a potential barrier, and then this is the uh, quantum region uh, of a potential that has a, 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 a well, and then it's back to a barrier and back to a well. These guys up here, where I have the thing hanging down, they're the ones that get the minus sign, and th th these, uh, this is the, the potential that was uh, working for this particular uh, one. Uh, these are bottoms, so this is this one is is the inverse of your your quantum mechanics. So your 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 well is here, your non-classical region is here. You're your, uh, your, 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 uh, able to move in here and here, you're not, and so forth. Okay. Well, let's start with a weird one. Let's start with just what is the first one here? A case of a pendulum. Uh, that is upside down and stable, being jerked up and down just right so it can maintain stability. And there it is. And there's the plot of its side-to-side -side motion. Gets close here, then gets far, and then gets close. And it will work just as well if I reach in there and start it here. Okay. Now you'll notice that it grows a little bit, and in fact this is going to be going unstable. So I, I'm now pushing the sine phi equals sine, and, and it's goodbye, Charlie. Mm -hmm. There's your trebuchet, you see. This one blows up because we're solving the equation that involves the sine of phi instead of phi. Okay. So expect a parametric amplification all the time. If you don't, uh, start out, and I'm just going to erase everything and start once again, maybe a little there closer. Yeah. Now that one, I didn't understand exactly what happened there. I must have given it a little jerk. <laughs> yeah, you can see it. The feed dot is actually uh, Let me try again. zero. That, that, so you drag that. You're actually imparting. Uh, yeah, you're imparting. There, there's two dot. zeros in phi dot. That should be good enough. Well, it got a little bit of a kick, so off it went. But that that is very close uh, to, and I'm going to put the uh, actual solutions on this screen so we can refer back to them. But let's go uh, do, uh, I'm going to go back, there's trebucheting again. It's, uh, the dominant mode is to uh, trebuchet in this business. Let's go back here and try for this one. This one is, uh, I think, one of the more beautiful ones of the inverteds. And this one is really stable. But there it is. Th I call this the unicycle mode. Um, if you ever ask anybody uh, how to ride a unicycle, and I recommend you just make unicycle riding a spectator sport, uh, 
it is a perfectly good way to cripple yourself. If you, when you fall from a unicycle, you fall. <laughs> but if you can hold a unicycle up, that's what, what you're going to be doing is this. Mm -hmm. You're pumping. You've got to pump. You've got to know what amplitude and what frequency to pump. Because any change of those, then you're out of here. <laughs> okay? It's very sensitive. But this particular mode is the most forgiving. I can put this one way off, and it, it recovers. You see? Now, if you're a tightrope walker, you're also doing this, but you're doing it with very small amplitudes. You finally according to people I know that can do this, uh, you don't, you're unconscious of it. And when you get that good, you can just walk on a tightrope with no problem. And if you've ever seen a movie called The Wire, it's being brought back now. Have you seen it? Mm -hmm. If you want to <laughs> see something amazing, see that movie. Because it's about a man who mastered tightrope walking to the point where he set up two cables between the two world tower, world trade towers right. before they were blown away. Okay? And he had to sneak up there to do it. So he had a team that produced, you know, they shot an arrow to get the cable over to the other corner. Mm -hmm. And then one morning he with the wind blowing, he's out there. Da -da. And they called the police, and the police came, and they were on both the towers saying, Come here, you get back here, you know. And he would go up to them, uh, and think says, Okay, I'm, I'm coming back. And as they reached for it, he just jumped up. Ha ha! <laughs> I mean, <laughs> and then he went out on the wire, and he got down on his back, as though he was going to sleep. You try to do that even on a floor. <laughs> it's, he was out on this wire with you know, everything going, right? Completely stable. He's just doing this all the time. As, as far as I can tell, I mean, some complicated version of this. Mm -hmm. They say, this is parametric stabilization. Finally, he you went know, back and he went to jail for a day or two. Uh, and, uh, Kind of never we weren't heard, heard about it until this movie. Is it, what is the name of the movie? Pardon? The oh, yeah. movie's name? Oh, yeah. the, the wire. Okay. The, meaning the thing you walked okay. on. It was a cable about, you know, three eighths of an inch or more uh, across. Yeah. So uh, what we're just looking at right now is this one. Okay? And these are the well tops, those are the well bottoms. Uh, in the non-classical region where it has exponential solutions, this thing happens to be a straight line. Then it does a marvelous curve here, okay, and it makes the bottom of a kind of like a cosine wave, but it isn't because this is changing so much. And then another straight line through there, and it's just right so it can stay. And it, it's, it's actually kind of hard to make this thing go unstable. Look at that. It just wants to go back to the center. So when we, we make one of these devices, this is the one we're going to shoot for just to get it working. The others are squirrely. This one we can get. No matter how badly we make the machine, it's going to work if we pick the parameters uh, right here. Okay? And you see, it's just hanging in there. You really have to get outside of the uh, thing here before it uh, takes off on you. Th th I think it's going to do it now. Yeah, there you go. Bam! It happens really suddenly in trebuchets. Okay? All right. Um, enough for the moment. Uh, let me just pause uh, and come back uh, here uh, to the um, lecture. And let's pick some of these just to see them. They're nowhere near as amazing once you've seen that remarkable uh, thing. But let me uh, point out that any uh, 
amplitude I uh, uh, pick, any, I should say any frequency I pick that falls me in this region here is stable. Not maybe as stable as the end one, but very stable. And of course they correspond to n values that are not plus or minus 2. The, the uh, ones in there could be n equal 10 cycles before it returns, you see. So it's a virtual continuum of possibilities in here that allow the inverted pendulum to uh, be. And of course, that's the saving grace for the tightrope walker or the unicycle person, is that they don't have to be on the boundary. Okay? All right. Let's go for uh, this one. This one's quite pretty uh, I, I, uh, as, as an inverted uh, mode. Uh, it's quite a, a nice one. It's just a square wave almost. And now you have to realize that the well bottom is up and the well top is down. But I can start on either side and it will hang in there pretty well. And it is pretty stable. It's, remember, hanging down, so why shouldn't it be, you might say. But it is being resonated, you see. And you see it went a little crazy there, and it's more amplitude there, so it's going to be out of here, probably. See, it, it's, it's showing its uh, uh, inability to completely uh, behave here, you see. Now sine phi is well outside of phi, or inside it, so we're going to be trebucheting fairly quickly here. One more maybe, and then wham! I gave it, well, not enough energy to really trebuchet, but eventually it's going to go crazy. Okay? So that, that's a pretty one, and as I say, uh, quite stable if I'm in the neighborhood uh, of there. And I'm resetting the phase each time I do that. If I didn't reset, you remember what happened. It's trebuchets immediately. So, you, you know, you've got to have your phase right in quantum mechanics. Keep the phase, baby, is a pretty good uh, aphorism uh, for uh, successful eigenchemistry and quantum mechanics. Uh, let's uh, try one more before we go on here. This is so much fun, since it works. Uh, this one is pretty standard, but worth looking at in any case. And uh, how stable is it? Well, it's okay. Remember, we're on the edges of all, all of the, all of these are on the edges of the band. I'm going to start it again with a little bit bigger amplitude and see what happens. You feel a little feet dot there. I Should did give it a little, yeah. Here it doesn't matter so much. It's right. when you're upside down that it matters. Here it, 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 uh, it, it can behave pretty well. I can go over the other side it's, there and it's more maybe go click real fast. So there's the minus of the wave function, which of course uh, is a nothing unusual for wave functions. You put any phase on them you want if it weren't for the fact you're trying for a bound state solution. So this one, this one is quite stable. I'd probably go out to about here and maybe I'll hold on. Remember that is the potential there with the bottoms on top and the top on bottom. This one is slowly working its way up and may actually come back. I think I've left this one on for a fairly long time and gotten away with it, but ooh, that doesn't look good if you're interested in staying down. <laughs> I think it's going to give some more energy to it. Remember, th this is a pendulum being pulled, so it's adding energy right there to the uh, bob. To the X motion. Actually, now I think it's going to. Oh, it's back. So th this is one that's stable, even with sine phi not equal to phi. 
So there's you know a lot more to this problem. This is the sine Gordon equ equation, the sine Sh Gordon or sine Schrodinger equation, not just the Schrodinger equation that we're solving uh, uh, when we play with the pendulum. Okay. In the interest of uh, time, I am going to uh, pause this and take us over uh, to the, uh, what we were just talking about. We'll bring it back uh, to this uh, screen here. Now, I don't have to show you the gap. You put this thing in the gap, it takes off immediately from top or bottom. If you have a force like this, jerk, 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 you get a band too, but much more complicated. Uh, that is something that I would like to explore too, but we uh, a little bit of time. The reason I show it is because it's these discrete bands that we're going to be talking a little bit about for the rest of the lectures. And they're described better in the uh, other textbook on quantum mechanics. Okay, back to some really simple stuff. And I'm referring to the B-type symmetry, the, the one that cor corresponds bilateral symmetry of either a Hamiltonian matrix, if it was a quantum mechanical two-level problem, or a spring hook spring constant matrix, uh, which is effectively, as I showed you uh, early yesterday, or uh, last lecture, uh, square of that matrix, in which uh, the um, components are quadratic in a parameter that uh, sits uh, in front of the um, operators uh, sigma uh, b and 1, the Pauli matrix sigma x, uh, actually, uh, that we talked about last time. Now, the purpose of this um, particular part of the lecture is to show you how to do uh, problems that have more than two uh, levels that are in resonance with each other and in particular are identical to each other, very much like the things that we were just describing. In this case, the, ref the sigma b is a reflection operator because its square is 1 and um, has a group multiplication table like that. And this is a little bit of this course that will involve using group theory to think about and actually calculate uh, solutions to problems. Like this one, but this one is so simple uh, that uh, you really don't need the group theory, but let's just do it by group theory in any case. The idea, uh, as I was trying to emphasize in lecture 23, is that we like to describe our states using operators. That is, if you can describe all the states in the system as being obtained from one of them, say state number one, and you just arbitrarily pick one of them, they're all equivalent, and you have to choose one to be the original or unit state, that would be this state right here, where I move the number zero uh, atom off center by a unit amount and left this one on center. And then this one is just a reflection of that. Um, <clears throat> and by reflection, I, uh, I mean uh, not a mirror reflection through this quite, because that would move it this way, but a situation where I have the same translation but on the um, right hand uh, atom. So e each of these can be labeled a number of different ways as uh, using bits of a two-bit register, zero and one binary, okay? This one I call X and this one I call Y as though it was an X and a Y plot that we used before to keep track of these uh, orbits, that's the ellipsometry view. Uh, or I can call it, uh, this one, uh, anything that is 0 mod 
2, I could call it 2 or 4 or so on, or I could call uh, this one anything that's minus 1 mod or as 1 mod 2, that minus 1 would be perfectly uh, good. The idea is to generalize this to, to uh, 3-bit and 4-bit and 5-bit uh, oscillators. It's sort of a direction that quantum information theory hasn't taken yet, but eventually will. Um, these operators that uh, give uh, the symmetry and all of the coordinates uh, also give projectors. That is, I have a minimal equation here, a sigma squared equal 1, that's the same as sigma squared minus 1 equals 0, which gives me two factors, each of which is uh, a projection operator that hasn't been normalized. Uh, if you normalize that projection operator, uh, in this case with uh, one plus uh, one minus a uh, minus one, which is two, in the denominator, then you get something that's a projective item potent, something that's squared to itself and adds up to one. That's the completeness relation. That's the orthogonality relation for. Uh, all the solutions that you would have here, but also all of the operators that would give those solutions. And that's the, uh, that's really all there is to using group theory in, in physics, is building projection operators that give you eigen solutions, and then tell you uh, a lot of things about those solutions. So uh, one of the uh, uh, modes is the P plus operator, which is one plus sigma P. If I add these two, I get a motion in which they go together. And if this were uh, transverse, it would be like our pendulum uh, swinging in the low frequency mode, in which we did not stretch the middle spring. And then the opposite of that uh, was two that are going very fast, because if this is a strong spring, uh, they have crushed it and they stretched it, and that adds to uh, the frequency of motion. In our case, we had pendulums that were in this mode doing this, and then the faster mode was one where they were out of phase, like those, only transverse. Okay? So we had a plus mode and a minus mode, or a zero mod two, and a, dear me, that's a typo, one mod two mode is uh, the minus projector. This is the plus projector. And we make tables of these things, and I've shown this kind of table already. We're going to make a much bigger version of it for bigger systems, uh, where you have them in phase, pretty much like our pendulum, but these are complex phasers I'm showing here, and then out of phase. And this is called a character table, and that's the simplest group theory character table uh, that's not completely trivial uh, that you would find in the back of a group theory book where they keep these things. Uh, we like to uh, view them a little differently. Uh, in fact, we like to fix them so you can uh, work them out in your head almost. Anyway, uh, I, I bring this up now because how do you solve this problem? This is still within the domain of being a qualifying exam problem. This thing has been used in various forms by uh, people besides myself. I, I have never given this problem. I have always felt sorry for the students that didn't take this course, uh, and so I didn't give this problem, but other people have, uh, the, you know, done that. Uh, I can name at least four people in the faculty have done this. So it's a possibility. And if you know this, you can breeze through this thing in seconds and go on to something else. But uh, it's also important for you to see it just because I want to generalize this to all n. And that's band theory, basically, uh, simple band theory. So uh, what we have here is a symmetry that involves uh, uh, the uh, rotation, not by 180 degrees or a reflection uh, just for a mirror, but a rotation by 120. So the states that I'm going to be looking at is 0, 1, and 2 or 0 mod 3, 1 mod 3, and 2 mod 3 as far as uh, location uh, goes. 
uh, the state 1, 0, 0 is that which, uh, every atom is on its equilibrium point except for this one, which is called the zeroth atom, mass point 0, and has been moved a unit distance in a radial direction. You see I have little frictionless um, uh, bars on uh, which they ride uh, uh, in this uh, uh, picture here. And then the 120 degree rotation of this one is this one, and then another 120 degree rotation is this. So those are the three orthogonal, we just declare them orthogonal, uh, states of this system. And I can take uh, any linear combination of these three to make an, uh, the general uh, state of this system. Now, this is a mechanical uh, picture. This could be a wave function in which the entire wave, that is this amplitude, is isolated on one atom, this one. And then I take that wave and move it over to here, that activity or whatever you want to call it, and then I move it over to here. Same arithmetic, same notation with bras and kets as this classical problem, you see. So once again, it's a three-dimensional oscillator but it's also a quantum mechanical problem that we're uh, solving with a matrix that looks like this. And what's really cool is the matrix, the most general matrix that you can have is a linear combination of the group operators that support its uh, manifold of states. So uh, I have this matrix and this matrix and this matrix and this matrix is just a unit matrix, but this one is precisely a matrix that has R1 at that place in the multiplication table. See the R1 here, here, and here? Well, that's where I put a 1 for that matrix. And then R2 is here, here, and here. That's the inverse of this one. That, that corresponds to the representation of the operator R squared. Okay? so. Uh, w once you get used to the fact that that's all there is uh, to this. Now, the question is, can these be complex? Yes, some can, some can't, depending on what you demand of this operator. If it's her mission, then these guys can be complex, provided this one is the conjugate of that one, this one the conjugate of that one. It'll still be a Hamiltonian, uh, her mission, a Hamiltonian. Okay? So there are the... Uh, uh, sort of connectors that show you who goes from what state to what state. And um, those R1s and R2s, you see they're off diagonal, they're the things that make things happen. The R0 is just giving you whatever energy you have at the locales. Presumably it's symmetric, so they're all three the same. And then these are the paths. And there are only two ways to go, 120 and minus 120. So they're the only operators in town that do anything. So the idea is that once you have that, all we need to do is figure out how to spectrally decompose all those operators at once. Then you've decomposed all of the Hamiltonians that are possible at once. And that's powerful. Okay, so if you have that power going into the qualifying exam and they do give you this problem, uh, here's the solution. You just have to figure out what are the roots three U, third U's of unity. These are the wave functions of the uh, system, just right there, but you have to know how to, how to put them. We're talking about solving the minimal equation R cubed equal one. That is R cubed minus one equals zero. Okay, three possible roots, okay? Third roots of e to the two pi i, which is one, right? So it's two pi i over three multiplied by an integer. And there's only three integers you could possibly have that are going to give you a different number. So this implies this for the Hamilton-Cayley equation of that operator. And there are the row one, row two, and row zero, okay? Um, in the complex plane, real axis, imaginary axis, okay? Now we know from what projectors do that we have to have completeness. The one operator has to be the sum of all three. 
And then if I multiply this by R, I have to get the eigenvalue of each of the projectors in front of the projectors. Namely, those three numbers will appear. And that's true when you square it, except now it'll be these numbers squared, which is another one of these numbers. Okay? So now you have the spectral decomposition group operators. It's simply a matter of doing a unitary, uh, uh, not a unitary, but a Hermitian transpose. Take the matrix that you see there, transpose it, that means conjugate and flip it. And so there are the projectors. That's your eigenfunctions right there, three of them, orthogonalized and in, in, in the form that uh, makes sense. They're actually the bras that you're uh, writing down, because the projection operators could be hit from the left, uh, and then be written as rows, or you can go with columns. That, that's okay, that's followed. Now, the notation here, m sub 3, that's m modulo 3. That means the number m, and you uh, ask for its remainder when divided by 3. This will be explained, I think, a little bit better on the next page. So th this is the uh, projection operator. This is the flip of it, which is giving us the actual bra states and will also be pet states. Here is the character table right here, written in the way I like to write it. It's not the way you find it when you look it up in the book, because they they don't think of phasers. But here are the phasers. Here are the phasers that when they turn, uh, make everything on the uh, molecule do the same thing. They're all copying each other. Here they're copying each other, but out of phase by 120 degrees. When you see those big uh, power lines out in the planes that carry the three phase uh, uh, power from s generator to city, okay, the three cables are either doing this, and that's if you're looking west, if you look east, they're doing this. Okay? They're exactly 120 degrees in phase from each other, which minimizes the actual voltage difference considerably, so they don't have, they can be million volt lines and still, you know, only a few meters of separation to avoid uh, arcing and corona uh, losses. So th this is a very, very powerful uh, piece of our uh, uh, infrastructure uh, right here. Uh, but we're just uh, we're now just talking about the pure solution of this problem. So um, when we think of a, a lattice modulo 3, we're really thinking of a loop like we've got here. And if you let L be the lattice length, that's 3 here, in the symmetry, also three here, lattice spacing is one here. If you want to uh, put a scale factor into the thing, that's uh, what you need to write down so that you can actually give a k vector in meters. The length here is going to be some number n, the symmetry number, times the lattice spacing, that standard notation for lattice spacing. Unfortunate, because A really should mean amplitude, but uh, you get used to these things after a while. So, lambda, that's wavelength, 2 pi over k, is going to be L over the integer uh, M. And M uh, stands for, and I'm putting it here, wave number momentum, or mode number. M for mode number, probably best a, a mnemonic. Okay, and P here is position, position point, two P's, okay, or power, power of the exponent uh, in these uh, operators here, zero power, one power squared, right, two power, okay, so it's position and power versus momentum or mode number uh, for the various modes. These are three orthogonal modes of this uh, Hamiltonian. No matter what values you put in for those R parameters that uh, do the tunneling uh, or the coupling between the states. So each quantum number follows a modular arithmetic. 
That's these quantum numbers and these. The sums or products of them are integer modulo 3. Always 1, 0, 1, uh, 2, or else, minus 1, 0, 1, or else, minus 2, minus 1, 0, etc. Depending on your choice of origin. Origin is, of course, uh, uh, anywhere you want to start. Okay? So, uh, when you say 4 mod 3, you remain the remainder of 4 divided by 3. What's left over if you do a division? Okay? It's 1 in that case. All right. Now, here's where you get the dispersion functions for the wave in a system like this. And uh, 3 is already enough to really begin talking about uh, waves. The idea is to take one of these m states that's been projected, and we know that the eigenvalues that uh, it, it gives is e to the i m p times 2 pi over 3. So that's what I'm writing out here uh, for uh, the zeroth point, the first point, and the second point, modulo 3. That's what uh, I'm getting. That's a dispersion relation right there. You've already written the dispersion function for this uh, system, just from the that very simple uh, idea of the roots of unity. Okay? So it's going to be the coefficient r0 at the center of the Hamiltonian diagonal. And then if the r1 and r2 are conjugates of each other, that means we have real parameters only in this thing, then you're going to get this. And there's the cosine that results from the summing of those two uh, exponentials. So here are your eigenvalues right there. You're done with the qualifying step problem at this point. They didn't want to ask for any more in the ones that I saw. <coughs> So it's one, two, three, you're done, right, once you learn this, okay? So there's the eigenvalues for a general case, for general momentum, you see. Any value of m, uh, I, I've got an answer, okay? Now, if it's a classical problem, remember that this thing has to have a square root put over it, right? For the quantum problem, that's the answer. The square root of that is the answer for the classical, right? Because k is a, a square, okay? These are the moving waves, the ones that, where the thing goes smoothly around. These are the standing waves where you take the conjugate and add it to the uh, thing. That makes a cosine standing wave. This makes a sine standing wave, okay? Frequency is still the same because those happen to be degenerate, those conjugate, if I have real eigenvalues. So either one of these has the eigenvalue r0 plus 2r. And then there's the ground state. I'm sorry, each one of these has r0 minus r. The ground state is by itself with r0 plus 2r. Or square root of that. Here's picture. This is the classical uh, picture. That's a phonon band. We're talking about vibrations here, right? So that's an elementary phonon band of a solid that only has three atoms hooked up in a triangle. Okay? That's a funny character table where only standing waves are drawn. There they are. Radial modes uh, is what I'm talking about here. Could be talking about angular. They're, they do the same thing. Those are what you call, might call longitudinal propagation waves. If they were only able to go around a ring. Seen both problems, I think. Now let's go jump to six, and we're getting uh, close to the end of of this um, period. So we're about where we should be on that. If I have six of these uh, guys uh, hooked up, that's not the only way to hook them up. I can put some extra springs to the next nearest neighbor. And I'd get a Hamiltonian like that. Or I could go clear across town with uh, tra trans uh, uh, coefficient here, tunneling across town. Okay? If only had that, that the Hamiltonian looked like this. Obviously, a general Hamiltonian would be a combination of these uh, three. But the solutions, same for all of them. 
Every one of them is solved by the same vectors that we get by projection. And that's really uh, very powerful. So if this were a more advanced place, we'd be given problems like this. But uh, fortunately, we're not. <laughs> okay. In any case, uh, here is the character table that I was talking about. And here are the waves. This is the way to get them uh, very quickly. Uh, you, you simply divide the uh, circle into six parts and go ahead and put one that's rotating six of a circle each time to make the number one momentum and then have them jump two every time and have number two momentum and then there's the conjugate of two and the conjugate of one and the only thing you're missing is the thing on the brillion zone boundary which consists of a solution you already know, anti-symmetric. Up, down, up, down, up, down. That's usually uh, called a B mode. B for back and forth. And this is called the A mode. A for always the same. That's my mnemonic. You won't hear that anywhere else, I don't think. Uh, and then these are called E modes when they get to de be degenerate, which they will be if you don't have any chiral um, complex uh, uh, coefficients uh, in your Hamiltonian. This is an E1 mode and this is an E2 mode together. Okay, and that means you can mix them into standing waves. This is already a standing wave and that was very obviously they're all together in phase. Standing wave just means you're either in phase or out of phase with everybody in your uh, ring. You're only allowed to use z uh, one and minus one as your phase. These others could have a phase anywhere. And as the modes can have it in any place on the sixth uh, point uh, star. So here's the dispersion relation that you get if you do the normal block thing that you see in uh, all of the solid state uh, physics books. It's kind of neat, too, because the eigenvalues are projections of the hexagon, starting with 0 mod 6, working up to plus and minus 1 mod 6, to 2, and finally 3 is a single one that uh, only counts for 1. So you have all together 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 eigenvalues that are nicely ordered for this Hamiltonian. This one it goes twice as fast. And this one goes three times as fast as far as dispersion. So the dispersion, uh, these things are the Fourier components, the T, the S, and the R, the three Fourier components, one, two, and three, of the dispersion function. That's good to know. And generalizes to uh, other things. You can also do gauge splitting when you let them be complex. If R is complex with a phase of phi, a gauge of phi, then the hexagon rotates by phi and all the eigenvalues do a funny Zeeman shifting that at first is second order, but for the uh, ones in the middle here is first order. Right away this one splits, right away that one splits and your dispersion function has literally slid to the left or the right when this turns. I've never seen this diagram anywhere, but it should be elsewhere. <laughs> okay, so remember, it, the, the article, this article makes a big fuss about this, uh, and that's just the start of that article, taken on to much bigger symmetries. So anyway, uh, as you go through the various integers, there are, uh, for each of them, a problem like that. And a first uh, nearest neighbor, uh, Hamiltonian, like that. If the thing is really cyclic, then you've got to remember that every row has two of these neighbor couplers. These are all right next to the K, but this one has to be on the other side, as does this one. If you cover those up, it's a completely different spectrum. 
So the spectrum is really sensitive to you uh, 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 killing one of those Ks. Breaking symmetry changes it so much. And that's interesting in its, in itself. This is just a picture of the complex numbers that are involved in each of those cases. Here's a C12, just to give you a picture, but we're only getting started here. Remember, these are all just sort of Bohr waves that are cataloged. This is what the waves actually look like, real and imaginary parts, uh, being uh, shown by solid and dashed lines, respectively. It's a funny way to draw a character table, but a really uh, illuminating and revealing way uh, to uh, draw a character table. This is the generalization of Fourier analysis. These are all Fourier transform matrices. And they're beautiful. C16, gorgeous. C32, even more so. C64, beautiful. All these things are, cap are, are able to do on Wave-It. Wave-It still needs a lot of work. And that's why we don't have links right now. We, we can put links in yeah. for that, uh, even in the state it is right now. Okay. okay. Uh, C100, that's a Fourier transform matrix for 100. That is the one in there. And that's 144. Mm -hmm. If you'd envision it be a little sensitive to you get a primer as, or not. As, as you make it bigger and bigger, you start seeing patterns within patterns within patterns uh, of these things. But remember, this is all we're plotting here. We're just plotting e to the 2 pi i over some big integer, in this case 100, times the product of the momentum and the position. This is k sub m times x sub p. And where that is constant, you have a hyperbola, right? See the hyperbolas? And they're all over the place, but you really see them in the corners, right? Okay. Well, because of this integer structure, there's uh, 256. That's even more than that one over there. All these little phasers being colored according to their phase. Because of that, um, other problems become really easy to solve. Here are just archetypical dispersion functions. My favorite one right now is relativistic dispersion, which looks like that for mass zero objects, looks like that, and another one below that's a voided crossing uh, for uh, massive objects. Remember that a dispersion function is a parabola usually at the bottom. That would be a Bohr dispersion, but the block dispersion is just a cosine. It's a projection of the uh, polygon uh, in a vertical uh, way. And then the Zeeman splitting causes this cause when I turn that thing a little bit, and all of these green things split up. But the red ones don't split. Red is uh, stop. That means it's a standing wave. The green ones are moving waves until they're split. Then they become weird things, galloping waves. I'll skip the discussion of all the Hamiltonians. But this is the basic idea of the dynamics, and I think at this point uh, we may want to call it. I don't know what the battery situation is. If we, if you could stand a few more minutes, we're going to go over something you've already seen. Remember the movie, The Titanic? Mm -hmm. I told you about something there that you should remember. Let's do it again. Okay. The beating that we've been talking about, where the thing starts on one place, that is, it starts uh, with, say, plane polarization, all on number uh, x, okay? And then branches out to become circular polarization, remember that, uh, as the beating uh, went on, okay? And then, at a, this was a quarter wave plate, the half wave plate, we had turned x into y in polarization terminology, right? Then we turn uh, the left circular into right circular as we go down into this region, and then uh, we come uh, back home to x, and we continue that uh, uh, in a b-type 
a resonance. That's what's going on here. This is space and time, and you're seeing uh, the zeros of the wave very clearly shown as an X moving basically uh, at 45 degrees if I made the wave velocity equal to 1 by scaling. Okay, so this particular situation right here is represented by those phasers. That's a quarter wave. That's a half wave where everything that was in the middle here is now at the other end of the circle. Remember, this is wrapped around. And then there's the uh, right circular and there's the uh, return uh, there. So this, this is the uh, uh, anatomy of a B-type beat for a C2 system that we looked at before. Well, what do the other ones do? C3, C4, C5. There's C3 doing its thing. I don't necessarily make a big point of, of th this, um, but um, I, I just want you to know it exists. That's the, uh, I'm sorry, that was the C2 system. Here's the C3 system. Doing its thing. Now, this is its thing. We can stop this thing at certain places where we have the sort of things that the, the beats have. This is analogous to the quarter wave and the half wave. This is a third wave and this is two-third wave. They're all equal, but with weird phases. Here's one involving four. But you'll see the C2 is buried in it. That's the subgroup of the symmetry. C C2 is a subgroup of C4. So when I stop this thing uh, at any one of these uh, places here, like right there, I, I'm, I'm gonna, actually this this one this was designed to uh, find those places, but it doesn't it, it doesn't work. Um, anyway, I was able. This is uh, actually C5, uh, and these are the uh, you know. One fifth, two fifth, three fifth, four fifth waves, and those are you know it doesn't have any uh, 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 divisors, so you, you you get a very simple uh, beating uh, pattern with this one. Um, here's C six now, okay, and I think I can play play this game. I can grab this thing, hopefully, and put it right under there. about that uh, that's not quite uh, it's it's uh, what they did was they converted the movie uh, to something else there there's a, a, a one of the uh, c6 things where they're all equal okay I'm trying to find that I should probably find it back here let's just go forward until we get it that, that not too far from it uh. Maybe not. There we go. Yeah. I, that's pretty close to this. Gauss, one of the great mathematicians, worried about things like this. And um, spent uh, basically 20 years of his valuable life just worrying about these things. If he'd only known that it was all done automatically by waves, he uh, could have gone on to something else. Uh, did so much already. He does, shouldn't be greedy. Anyway, this this is an example of beating going on. If I start with everything in one point and let it evolve all over the place and then return to that one point, you know, what's called a grand revival. All of the time, it's finding all the divisors of its own integer, which is six in this case. So, if you want to, you know, find uh, uh, rational uh, factors of some huge number, you simply build a wave machine with that huge number of oscillators and let it spit them out at you. That's a little bit uh, simplified, but it's basically the idea. Now, remember this stuff where you started out a Bohr orbital? 
and made the uh, all these funny lines with the zeros. Okay, uh, this particular uh, thing stops at three. If we were to stop at three, one third. Okay, I would see one of those. Uh, whatever you want to call it, the, the one-third wave, the one-third uh, resonance, okay? And so that's the actual phase located right here, here, and here, where there is something. The rest of it's pretty much zero. So this is a space-time graph which not only has um, you know, where all of the fractions are for a particular thing up to whatever my Fourier uh, range is, is allowing me, but it also tells you where you are. Each one of those points is unique. A unique signpost that tells you not only what time it is, but where you are. It's a gigantic timekeeper, a space locator. And so that is where it got us interested. And uh, this is the uh, C2 one. There's uh, about three, three uh, states. You gotta count minus threes and plus three. So it's about z zero, one, two, three, maybe four, but more like delta M of three. So the width of this in momentum space is roughly three. And then that product with uh, delta x down here comes out to be uh, uh, a unit in our phase. Professor Harder, could, yeah. could you pause there just one sec? Because here, if I'm seeing this or hearing this right, and let me try and regurgitate it again, you're, you have something that is in essence interfering with itself. The wave of the Bohr wave that lives on the ring of uh, this uh, picture right here, where the potential is essentially zero everywhere. Okay. And from that, you realized a, a measurement device for both position and time. Yes. Now, if you consider two separate waves that might actually be governed by special well, relativity, could this idea not be just extrapolated to? It could, absolutely. But remember, by making that horrendously narrow uh, delta x here, the, I mean, I, I'm only taking up at the initial time 4% of the circumference. The rest of it's zero. The white is zero, okay? Mm -hmm. So I've got this huge peak uh, right here, which we've shown movies of. It might be worthwhile doing it again, but we better get going here. Um, so in order to get that, I needed 18, that's 2 times 9, non-amp equals 0 waves. So in a sense, this is made of 18 pieces. Mm -hmm. We're all piled up here and then show their structure and then regroup up here. But at half time, they regroup on the other side. Remember how that worked? We used to show a little ring with the thing going around and ringing, right? Mm -hmm. This is just a display that makes it um, more like a space-time diagram, which would exist. With uh, the, these are the same waves that you play with to make our relativity, uh -huh. and relativity kind of shows that. We've got to get your uh, friend to do a, a um, musical based on these. When they're rationally related, uh, it would actually be something that you might want to listen to. So uh, those are the lines that I'm talking about. It's very much like our monster mash in Lecture 5. A bunch of lines that are rationally related in slope and positioned. Okay. Uh, here's the thing that actually calculates when they intersect. I have two pairs of them with different uh, denominators. Uh, a big, say, a big denominator and a not so big denominator. They cross at lots of places, but the one that uh, N1 and N2 uh, is living at is crossing, and we studied this all the way, at time, sum of n over denominator uh, d for those uh, to cross. And that's called a fairy sum, which is a, a 
John Ferry, 1816, uh, working on tides and realizing that for every time I see a particular uh, fraction and it's sort of near another one, even if it isn't near it, a fairy sum will have a resonance that's between there that is uh, perhaps observable, otherwise not. And the actual place that it occurs, the actual angle phi, is given by this very strange uh, uh, cross product of the uh, two uh, numerator denominator vectors uh, divided by the sum of the denominators, just like the fairy uh, sum. So it's this business, these n over d uh, things that occupy real space time. So this is the denominator versus numerator space that we talked about before. Okay, and the first one to look at is 1 over 1. Big circle of 1 and 1. Okay, and the sum of that with the 1 half. Okay, numerator 1, denominator 2. Okay, there's numerator 1 and the coordinate denominator 2. And it points at, oh, of course, 0.5, you see. It's, this is the way you locate the reals that belong to the uh, fraction space. And the way we can understand uh, those things that are uh, very much like fractals. I would say they are fractals. So um, the idea is that that vector V2 that we say points at a, uh, a sum, a fairy sum of the fractions 0, 1, and 1, 1. And that's why fairy stuff works. And then you can go ahead and uh, draw an intersection. S just simply uh, take the V0 circle radius and the V2 circle radius is just what you uh, uh, use to make the V1 and the V2. Okay? And that's another circle that's of, of very great interest. Points to the center of it. And all you have to do is draw that circle through the point 0.5 and it will automatically be tangent to the uh, primitive circles. So this is the least next uh, primitive fraction, one half, which uh, a star is very finely in the movie Titanic. Okay, and then the fairy sum tree that you make by adding these things is precisely what goes on each time I make another fairy sum. I get another circle and another fraction, in this case one third uh, is being pointed out here. Uh, and you can construct, you know, up to however much you have the resolution to see. So this is something that was recently published uh, with regard to the Morse potential by uh, Aldous and Lee and I uh, just this year, just this summer in fact. Um, the fact that you can uh, take every one of these circles, they're called Ford circles, and break them into a Thales rectangle that belongs to the fraction that they're touching is uh, very interesting and perhaps useful for something. We don't know yet. Anyway, um, I think we're going to go ahead and stop there. This goes on to talk about differential operators of various powers that use binomial coefficients and relates to Fourier analysis. That takes us into uh, some pretty neat wave mechanics, but uh, we'll call it for now. And uh, go see the movie The Wire, and you can Man see Titanic as well. <laughs> <laughs>